I want to uh, welcome everyone to this uh, broadcast, and uh, let me just say hello. I'm Dan Gilmore from the uh, Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University, and uh, I'm with the Global Editors Network that's putting on the uh, Hack Days for investigative reporters here uh, this week. And it's uh, a great honor for me personally to be able to introduce to you uh, someone who has, uh, in ways that most people can never do, has changed the world and changed journalism in the process. And we have a lot to think about because of what uh, Edward Snowden has done. And I'm going to now put his picture back up and leave it up because he is the person you're here to see. Uh, I have it not on this screen, but on my computer next to it, I have a uh, tweet from uh, Edward Snowden that says, uh, new report, if you use AT&T, they've been tracking you since 1987 and secretly selling it to the cops without a warrant. This is... Uh, pointing to a story in an online publication in the U.S. called The Daily Beast. Uh, aha! I, I guess you're showing it to us from your computer. And this is uh, pretty remarkable stuff, and uh, it makes it worth starting off with a question that I think we have to answer and ask anyway as journalists and then start to find answers that, uh, you know, journalism is getting uh, a lot harder to do in some ways, especially national security or investigative journalism uh, in a world of pervasive surveillance. And I wanted to start with asking you uh, about what we should be thinking about as journalists, given what's going on. And that story was a remarkable new peg on this issue. So please jump in. Yeah, I mean, this yeah, is I mean, one this of the really central, central issues in investigative uh, Sorry, I, I see we're missing an audio problem. problem. I'm hearing I'm myself, myself being, being fed, fed back, back in, in uh, through, through your system. System. I'm going to have to remove my... my Unless you can mute your uh, stage mic to me. Okay, actually, uh, whoever's working the tech fixed that. That's great. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, yeah, one of the central issues that we're facing in investigative journalism today is the whole question of can you maintain a confidentiality of sourcing? Uh, because, of course, journalists can't work without sources, without having people who work inside institutions, within organizations, within agencies of government. Uh, who are telling them generally what's going on or confirming a fact or a journalist says, hey, I heard this or this official made this statement. Uh, what does that actually mean? Uh, what is the truth? And unfortunately, particularly in the United States, we see that there has been uh, an extraordinarily aggressive push in the last decade uh, to punish this. And this is something that's not just happening uh, in the context of shall we say, for example, uh, national security leaks alone. Although this is where we see it uh, in, in the primary case, where an individual comes forward and they're, whether or not they're talking about uh, programs which could be illegal, could be unconstitutional, but which indicate some kind of questionable activity, uh, something that could be uh, basically a violation of law, the government will actually use its authorities uh, to go after the sources of the news reports uh, criminally. And journalists have actually been, uh, courts have leaned on them to try to get them to disclose uh, their sources. Let me see if I can actually uh, find the source that I have for this. Apologies. Uh, yeah, so we have the New York Times in the United States. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that mirrored for you or is that readable? Uh, because I'm, I'm seeing a conflict. Uh, where I can't tell if you guys are seeing that backwards or forwards. We're seeing it the way it should be. Okay, good. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so 
This is the executive editor of the New York Times. Uh, you can think, well, you're all journalists. I don't need to explain that. But for people on the stream uh, who are watching this at home, uh, this is what you can think of as sort of the, the director of the New York Times. Uh, and she said that the Obama White House, uh, which campaigned on uh, the platform of being the most transparent White House administration in U.S. history, uh, was in fact the most secretive that she had ever dealt with in 22 years uh, of her career in Washington and covering presidents uh, from Ronald Reagan onward. Now, this White House has brought forward more criminal leak investigations of journalistic sources um, than all other White House administrations combined. Uh, and this is something that continues to grow. We see a uh, sort of hand waving about a new leak investigation coming for an official who is a, a contractor who is working for the NSA, uh, who was secretly arrested in August. Uh, but this was only revealed uh, a month or possibly a little over a month later. And it appears that the Obama administration basically doesn't want to charge this individual with espionage until the next uh, White House administration comes in. So sort of they can cook the books and the numbers will fall in the other administration instead of running up Obama's. Uh, this is James Risen. He's the most famous national security reporter at the New York Times again. Uh, the White House uh, and the Department of Justice leaned on him to get him to reveal his source uh, about a CIA operation that had gone wrong. Uh, they had been uh, attempting to send fake plans to the Iranians uh, in theory uh, but they had actually screwed up the plan. It was a bad plan, and it actually accelerated the Iranian nuclear program uh, instead of hindering it because the sort of booby trap that they thought they put in the plan uh, was ridiculously weak, and the scientists who received the plans uh, could immediately correct it. Uh, now, despite that being clear and prevailing public interest, that individual was charged. But this brings us back to the central question of, okay, so we know that governments now are trying to go after journalists' sources. Uh, but how is this actually happening mechanically? How are these sources being revealed? Which brings us to the story that uh, Mr. Gilmore uh, mentioned in the introduction, uh, which was just published yesterday in an outlet called The Daily Beast by journalist Kenneth Lip uh, about this program at NSA called, or sorry, uh, this program at at and I apologize, called Hemisphere. Uh, now, the idea here. Uh, these are the, the uh, basically the summary of the new facts from the story, uh, is that at and is uh, recording basically everything that travels over the network and saving it. They have a, a storage facility, uh, I believe, that's been estimated in the range of petabytes, uh, a petabyte being a million gigabytes. Um, and they're storing the metadata of communications, right? This is not what you said on the phone call. This is just the fact that you picked up the phone and dialed someone on it, who you dialed, how long you were on the phone with them with, uh, and you know how frequently you're calling these people and so on, the kind of analytics that come out of it. Who are your routine contacts? When a new story comes out, who do you call first uh, for comment? These are the kind of things that can be derived from that kind of metadata. They've been storing that back to 1987. And here's something that is a new fact, uh, because that story or that fact was actually brought forward by the New York Times in 2013, uh, although they thought the program was only used for drug investigations in the United States. Uh, yesterday, we found out that it's being used for everything down to Medicare fraud, uh, which you can think of as uh, kind of social medical benefits in the United States, because remember, we don't have universal health insurance there. Uh, so you got to sort of get money from the government for this, get benefits directly. Um, so the second thing is this about uh, cell tower data, right? Your cellular tower data is when you think about, uh, well, I'll, I'll get into that in a second, uh, but they were storing these records going back to July of 2008, which is far longer than all of the other service providers uh, in the United States. Verizon, the other leading uh, phone company in the US holds them for about a year, Sprint holds them for a year and a half uh, based on what we knew at the time in 2008. Moreover, What's really fascinating here is although pretty much every uh, law enforcement agency in or every uh, telecommunications service in major established governments with major intelligence agencies has some obligation to share information uh, with law enforcement agencies, uh, they have to do this in response to a legal request, typically often one that's signed by a judge, a warrant or subpoena. 
Uh, and these agency or these uh, telecommunications service providers have to respond very narrowly, right? They have to say, all right, we'll give you just this that the police asked for. Uh, this story revealed something that was very different, uh, and I suspect this is happening around the world on a more and more frequent basis, uh, where these intelligent, or excuse me, I keep getting them confused because their work is now so similar nowadays. Uh, these telecommunications agencies uh, go, well, we already are required to store this information for one reason, because we've got to be able to turn it over to government uh, for a certain period. But this, since this is a business, can we come up with some structure of value add to this? Can we make this more attractive to government? Can we make them pay for this? And so AT&T uh, experimented and they found out the answer was yes. Instead of just holding it for the statutory requirement of one year, uh, or even going sort of above and beyond like Sprint and going for a year and a half, they said, we'll store this forever. They've been doing this since 1987 or back to 2008 uh, in, in the case of the uh, cell phone tower data. And then rather than the demanding the government uh, come to us with a warrant and force us to search this data, what if we just sold them access as a service? What if we said rather than the government having to get a warrant, uh, they simply get some lower standard of uh, uh, legal process, like an administrative subpoena, which doesn't have to be signed by judges in many cases. It can come from the law enforcement agencies directly, where the agency uh, or the officer just says, I want this, uh, can you provide this? Uh, and then they send some money to these companies and they'll return, they'll actually do the search for them. They'll act as sort of a mini NSA here. Uh, now, What's interesting about this 2008 of July date uh, that struck out, stuck out at this story uh, like a, a sore thumb for me, and, and again, this just came out yesterday, so this is very much developing. Maybe you guys could do some follow-up reporting on this, uh, is that uh, they say it goes back to July 2008, and that's such a strange date because in the United States, that is the precise month that the FISA Amendments Act, uh, or the FAA as we call it, which is uh, an amendment to a 1978 law, uh, which basically is what allows the United States, uh, this amendment is what allows all of the US intelligence agencies to search through anybody who is not an American, uh, their records without a warrant. Uh, instead, the Attorney General signs a general warrant for classes of behavior, uh, things like they think you're associated with a foreign government, uh, or you have some information on counterterrorism or something like that, then the agents at the NSA, for example, myself in Hawaii, could on our own assertion of what a legal standard we refer to as reasonable articulable suspicion, uh, which is a very low legal standard. Uh, we call it internally a gut feeling that you can write down. Uh, we can then go to these companies and say, uh, provide us this, or we can search on the basis of your email address and pull anything out of the system. But that also happened in July of 2008. Uh, so as soon as this law was passed, and this law actually came into being because of the lobbying of telecommunications companies such as AT&T, uh, in uh, the wake of 2001, uh, the Bush White House created a warrantless wiretapping program, which was not authorized by any statute or law uh, on the president's own authority. It was later found to be unconstitutional. It said, we're going to start collecting records from everybody uh, from the largest telecommunications companies uh, in the United States. But how did they do that? They went to these companies uh, and brought a letter from the president, basically, saying, will you help us? Uh, this is not authorized by statute, uh, and this is, in fact, of very questionable uh, legality. But the president's asking, we've just had a terrorist attack, will you help us? And unfortunately, in many of these cases, uh, these companies said, no matter what the law says, sure, we'll help you. But then, thanks to the work of people like uh, you sitting in this room, uh, investigative journalists uncovered what was actually happening. Uh, it was supposed to come forward in 2003 uh, in the New York Times that uh, reporter we talked about earlier, James Risen, found out about this program. The New York Times got a call from the White House saying, please don't do this uh, before the election, basically. There will be blood on your hands and everything like that. The New York Times actually said yes. They didn't publish this story until after Bush was reelected. Uh, and I believe in 2005 or 2006, this story finally hit the front pages because that journalist, James Risen, uh, was going to publish this uh, in his own book. And the New York Times didn't want to be embarrassed by getting scooped by their own reporter, so they brought it forward. 
This meant all of those uh, telecommunications service providers that had secretly been collaborating with White House immediately got sued by their customers on a massive class action basis because the penalties uh, for violating these laws that they had done uh, were in a criminal context 10 years per count, uh, but in a civil context, I believe thousands and thousands of dollars for every communication they intercepted. Now, they were intercepting billions and billions of communications per day, uh, so this would have led to the largest uh, civil damages in history, likely, uh, and put them all out of business. Uh, so they said, look, we're going to cut you off, government, uh, unless you immunize us against these civil suits. And what's fascinating here is they said, don't only immunize us from these claims in the future, we want you to retroactively immunize us against the lawsuits that have already been brought against us for the laws that we already broke. And strangely enough, the government did this. In 2007, they passed an emergency law that only would exist for one year, uh, which basically everybody in Congress uh, voted for without really reading or thinking about uh, because they cleverly entitled it the Protect America Act. The next year in 2008, this law was made permanent uh, under the FISA Amendments Act that we just revealed was in June 2008. Now, why is this relevant to you? Why does this matter so much? The reason why is that cell phone tower data that uh, was started being collected in June or July 2008, sorry, started being saved since July 2008 on a permanent basis, uh, reveals so much more than just who you call. On the basis of how cell phone technology works, right, uh, how does, you, when you dial somebody, how does sort of the world know to make only that phone ring uh, when you're calling it from this phone over here? Well, they need to make sure that the person calling you is basically an authorized subscriber. They paid their bill and everything like that. Uh, they're connected to the service, which means that every cell phone tower that this person is around, their cell phone is constantly announcing, here I am, here I am. This is the SIM card number in my phone. This is the handset number of my phone. Uh, so they can work out the compatibility for that. And when I'm dialing this phone number, you need to do the reverse on the other side. You need to look for their SIM card. You need to look for their handset number. Uh, and you've got to find out of all of the cell phone towers in the world, which one are they connected to? And of all of the different cell phones that are connected to those cell phone towers, which, ones is, which one is theirs? So only the cell phone rings. That's kind of the, the brief synopsis for that. But what this means is that everywhere you keep your cell phone with you, everywhere your cell phone has ever traveled, is creating these registrations with the nearest cellular tower you're at. The same thing happens with the people that you're meeting with. Now, I don't like to be the kind of person that's uh, sort of all tinfoil hat and says, you know, you can't trust your phone, you can't use things like that. But you need to be aware of when you need to maintain the confidentiality of your communications. That is, you need to protect what was actually said within the communication, uh, what happened within the conversation. <laughs> And then when you need to have a higher level of protection, when you need to actually protect the anonymity of the parties involved, when the source can't be linked to it in any way, when there can't be a record that they called your desk, they called your office, that you met with them at a coffee shop, that your two cell phones were in the same parking garage at the same time. This, unfortunately, is a paradigm that we're very rapidly uh, moving toward. And I think we need to be focused on the fact that this stuff isn't just coming from governments now. This is coming from businesses. They're collecting far more than what is necessary uh, for the basic operations of their businesses. And really scrutinize what this means for your sector, for your industry, and for the traditional methods of investigative reporting and how we can start to counter them. And if necessary, defeat these capabilities to protect sources. So we're here in the uh, offices of uh, the German publication, Süddeutsche uh, Zeitung. And should we presume here in Europe that the same activities are taking place and in other countries around the world? You alluded to that. Do you, do you think this kind of recording and storage is taking place everywhere? It's definitely happening at phone companies. Uh, the question that's of, of primary importance in distinguishing jurisdictions today uh, is through what legal mechanisms, what burdens can governments get this information out of the phone companies? When can they say we have to provide this to them? And is it legal 
for uh, telecommunication service providers to say, well, if the government doesn't compel us to do this stuff, we don't have legal process, our customers don't actually own these records. These are records that we, the phone company, would allege that we own. You don't have an interest in the privacy of your cellular phone records. Uh, this is the way it is in the United States under a 1970s Supreme Court decision that it, uh, called Smith versus Maryland that established a principle in the United States we call the third party doctrine. When you dial a phone call, uh, when you send an email, when you use the internet, this is how the government is maximally interpreting it. We haven't actually gotten this reviewed since the 1970s, so we don't know if it will still hold today. But the government and these companies are interpreting it to mean uh, that you don't actually have any control over these records. You don't have any say over how they're used. They're the property of the company. Therefore, if the company uh, wants to voluntarily start selling these records, and not necessarily to advertising companies, not selling to anyone, but secretly to the government as a service, that's actually legal. They're not breaking any laws. Now, Germany does have uh, some better restrictions uh, in some ways than many other European uh, uh, jurisdictions. They have, for example, the foundational G10 privacy law. Uh, but we have seen laws being passed in Germany that are uh, presented as if they're intelligence reforms. But as we actually start to go through the fine print and see what it's saying, they are legitimizing uh, the policies of mass surveillance, or as the government would call them, bulk collection. Uh, and this is a fundamentally dangerous thing because all of the things that caused the scandal, they're now saying, well, we're not going to stop them. Uh, we're actually going to expand them. We're going to extend these capabilities. We're just going to make them more open. Uh, yes, we will spy on everyone, uh, but we'll tell you that we're doing it. So then it's okay. Well, then, so what, let's let's get a little specific on what, what should journalists be uh, doing and and maybe extend that to the general public that doesn't particularly want to be spied on. But journalists have a special case here. What what should we be doing uh, in our daily practices with phones, with email, et cetera? Uh, well, if I try to give you sort of the, uh, this is what you do, here's how you do it, this would take much more time than we have available today uh, specifically. But let's talk about the more important practical things. Uh, and this is actually, I, I think, a, uh, a sectoral thing, right? Journalists have a uh, specific professional need as a class to have access to truly anonymous communications. Uh, they recognize uh, that privacy is a foundational right, right? You cannot have freedom of the press without a right to privacy, because without that, you cannot protect the confidentiality uh, of that journalist source communication. Uh, and without freedom of the press, uh, without a meaningful freedom of the press, sorry. Uh, if you can write anything you want, but you can't actually learn anything, it doesn't have that much meaning, right? Uh, privacy is what gives these other rights. Privacy is kind of the fountainhead from which the meaning of other rights is derived. Freedom of speech doesn't mean very much uh, unless you have the space to decide what it is that you actually want to say. Unless you have that, that protected area in which you can confide with friends, with colleagues, uh, with rivals, the things that you're thinking about and sort of test them to see, are they reasonable? Uh, are the, is the reasoning that I use to develop these ideas, these arguments, uh, <coughs> these stories that I want to share, uh, rigorous enough that I want to share them with the public uh, without suffering the prejudice and judgment of a larger crowd uh, that doesn't have any particular interest in my well-being? Uh, the same thing goes down to freedom of worship. Uh, are you simply inheriting a belief? Uh, and you're afraid to test it, you're afraid to try something else because you're afraid of how you'll be judged, or do you have the ability without people monitoring you, without people seeing what's going on with you, uh, to figure it out how it is that you truly want to worship, how it is that you truly want to live. Uh, but this thing here is how do we combat this? How do we ensure uh, that we enjoy a free press uh, that is actually an effective investigative tool uh, in the next decades, the coming decades. And the central thing here is, uh, in much of the reporting around these surveillance issues, we have seen uh, journalistic outlets who have unfortunately been 
somewhat timid uh, about condemning these actions uh, in their reporting, their actual reporting, right? In the editorial side, they'll take a bold position, they'll make an opinion piece here, uh, they'll say this is bad. But in the reporting take, uh, they will not use their institutional voice uh, to make an actual calculation here uh, about the value of these programs and the threat that they represent uh, to the traditional operation of the press. Uh, to the traditional operation of a free society and the threat that they represent to individuals. And this is understandable, right? Most journalistic institutions uh, simply want to report what this side said and what this side said without really getting in the middle. Uh, but this is a core interest of journalists, and this is one of the few uh, public levers of influence uh, that we, sort of civil society, have over these extraordinarily powerful uh, government institutions, right? We're talking about spies that, if we're being honest, uh, do have a mandate to break laws with a startling regularity, uh, as long as they can justify it in their terms behind closed doors to government officials as being for the public good. But if we can weigh the public good more openly, if journalists uh, have access to some of these facts and can actually uh, assess them independently outside of those closed doors of government, we can start to have a very different conversation where the government actually has to make a real uh, and, shall we say, um, more fair uh, balancing of interests uh, than they do if the press acts less adversarially uh, on this issue. The press can, and I would argue should be, absolutely as adversarial as possible here because you're one of the only ones who truly can. Uh, this, more than a technical fight, is a policy fight uh, because if we get to the point of technical battles, you're going to be fighting underfunded newsrooms uh, or it's going to be underfunded newsrooms uh, against some of the wealthiest intelligence agencies in the world. And this is not uh, just me uh, alleging this. This is something that we actually see as fact. Uh, this is Ahmed Mansour. Uh, he is a dissident uh, operating out of, uh, I could get the country of origin wrong here, so I'm not going to state it. Uh, I believe it's Qatar or uh, the UAE, uh, but fact check me on that one. Uh, this was an individual who has been hacked countless times in the last several years. Uh, recently, malware was discovered on his phone uh, that was created by a commercial group uh, called the NSA, NSO Group, which is a U.S.-owned corporation now, uh, originally founded in Israel, uh, but it's U.S.-owned. Uh, and they were selling uh, million-dollar implants, right, that would break into the latest and greatest iPhones uh, and other things, you know, your Android phone, so on and so forth, uh, to track him because they didn't like uh, his condemnation of their policies. Uh, this was reported in the New York Times. Uh, this thing is a consistent and continuing problem. Uh, I don't have the extra reporting here that just happened in the last few days, uh, but we have seen more stories uh, just in the last few days uh, coming out of The Intercept and elsewhere uh, that show these governments are increasingly hiring technical talent, uh, paying up to half million dollars a year in salary uh, for people who aren't even that hot, but they're simply willing to work for these governments. Uh, to specifically target the communications of activists and journalists. Uh, journalists are specifically named as targets. Uh, and this is something that the NSA itself has done. They've targeted journalists uh, in areas like Pakistan, uh, where they thought they had access to interesting information, maybe about Al-Qaeda, uh, maybe about adversary groups out there, maybe about political groups. Uh, the journalists just get it first. Uh, so journalists are increasingly a threatened class uh, when we think about uh, the right to privacy. And the point that I'm trying to make here is, yes, I can give you tips on how to protect your communications, but you're going to be engaging in an arms race you simply cannot win. You must fight this on the front pages and you must win if you want to be able to report in the same way that you've been able to do for the previous centuries, honestly. Well, that's bad news. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, you, you wrote a piece uh, a while back for, uh, or were quoted in, in the uh, Intercept uh, with some of the things that ordinary folks can do. Um, and uh, right. I, in 1997 or so, 
I put PGP on a computer I was using and at the bottom of my newspaper column put the fingerprint and in three or four years that it was there got like three or four emails one of which said <laughs> I wanted I just wanted to see if this works and then 20 years later installed PGP or G, GPG again on on a, my current computer and it was still really hard to do yeah this stuff doesn't seem easy yeah uh, this is a, uh, again, one of the real problems that we have is we have technologies uh, that can protect communications uh, in an unbreakable format when they're in transit, right? Uh, governments have reacted to this as if we've thrown them in a pool of acid, uh, saying, you know, you're shutting us out, we're going dark. We know this is false. Uh, any government official who claims we're going false or we're going dark uh, is lying. They are making a knowingly false statement or they have been informed or briefed by someone who is making a knowingly false statement to them. Uh, we know this because we have classified documents from inside government uh, and we have uh, reportage from journalists who were in private sessions with these officials. Uh, we're behind closed doors. They describe today as the golden age of surveillance. And of course, based on the stories we see yesterday uh, regarding the operations of the telecommunication service providers, uh, and stories that we have from prior years, like 2013, uh, where we're talking about things like Prism, of course, where the biggest internet service providers uh, from around the world were voluntarily cooperating far beyond what was legally required of them uh, with governments such as the United States, bypassing warrant requirements as long as they weren't, as long as the targets weren't United States citizens and so on and so forth, uh, that, that things are pretty bad. Uh, for our side, for the government side, it's never been easier. Uh, but how do we reconcile this with this idea that, you know, these are theoretically, as far as our understanding of mathematics uh, goes, unbreakable communications? Well, it's because what we're doing is we're thwarting mass surveillance when we use encryption. We're not stopping targeted surveillance. Uh, because even again, if you have the most well encrypted device in the world, uh, if the government spends a million dollars to pay a hacker uh, to exploit your phone personally, uh, they will very likely succeed. In our current state of the art, uh, it is simply true that offense is easier than defense. Uh, and this is an unfortunate artifact uh, of the fact that governments around the world have prioritized offensive capabilities uh, for the benefit of spying on people. Uh, so much more strongly than they have defensive capabilities preventing our countries from being hacked. And this is what's leading to the kind of dynamics we see today where suddenly uh, other hackers that the government does not approve of are starting to say, hey, we're getting hacked. We're getting hacked all of the time, whether it's the Office of Personnel Management, whether it's this recent Democratic National Committee hack, uh, whether it's all of these other things uh, about infrastructural hacks, fear of the power grid being attacked. These were preventable problems, uh, but unfortunately, we don't have this pressure uh, that should be simply blistering uh, coming from newspapers going, we are the most advanced societies in the world. We are the most connected societies in the world. And in some sort of computer-based conflict, I'm making an intentional effort to avoid the word cyber here because cyber simply means related to computers. Um, in computer-based conflicts, we have more to lose. We can hack Russia 10 times, right? It will cause less damage to them than one hack to us will cause. We can hack North Korea a thousand times and they will suffer less damage than if they hack us a single time. This is not a game that we want to get in, so then why are we doing so? It's because policy is short-sighted and policy is only short-sighted here because it is not being publicly debated. It is not being openly scrutinized uh, outside of this audience of a few special interests. Uh, let me ask you, when you've talked a bit about journalism and newspapers, and when you uh, had to make a decision on what you were going to do with the documents from NSA, you made a you made a choice, and that choice was to go to journalists rather than putting them out there uh, as 
has been done in some in other cases. Yeah, I could have put what? these up on my own. Uh, so, yeah. would you talk a bit about why you did that? What was the reason that you went to journalists with it? Yeah, for for me, this was very important uh, because I had such strong political beliefs. Uh, I had discussed this with my colleagues internally. Uh, these programs, sorry, not my not my intentions, of course. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> or if I had, I certainly couldn't say this in a recorded Google Hangout uh, on YouTube, or the FBI would be talking to my coworkers in a, a, a not so pleasant manner. Um, but yeah, uh, so I showed them things uh, like, for example, uh, the heat map uh, that the NSA had. This was a top secret program, so helpfully called Boundless Informant. Uh, the, the closer to red it is, the more yellow it is, uh, the more we're collecting communications from these regions. This is not a total map, uh, but this is a pretty accurate map uh, generally for what we had, uh, where we were going, uh, except it excludes some of the programs that most strongly target the United States. Uh, so the United States would in reality be bright red uh, if this were including all of the statistics from U.S. telecommunications service providers uh, such as AT&T, which at the time were providing these records directly to the, 18, or, or to the NSA, but in the wake of 2013 were by law uh, prohibited from doing so directly and they had to change things around a little bit. Uh, but it shows, for example, we were collecting more communications from Americans than we were from Russians. Uh, and this begged the question of, was this right? Was this what we set out to do? Was this how the NSA was supposed to sort of defend freedom and democracy and liberty and all of these things that if you take a, a positive uh, view on what these people sign up to do, and I, I did because I was one of them, uh, was this consistent with our mission? Uh, and unfortunately, most of these individuals agreed that it was not. Uh, however, maybe I was wrong, right? I wasn't the director of the NSA. I wasn't the top lawyer. Maybe I didn't know what I was talking about. Maybe I was making a huge mistake. I didn't want to harm anyone. Uh, and more critically, uh, even though I knew my intention wasn't to harm anyone, I was very concerned with the risks that I made a mistake. So I set out to devise uh, a system in which I could mitigate those risks to the maximum extent possible by uh, imitating the model of checks and balances that was supposed to exist in the United States government that had unfortunately failed. These sort of three co-equal branches of government that are sort of supposed to police each other. You have the executive, uh, you have the Congress, and you have the courts, and they're constantly supposed to be uh, attacking each other to see if they have uh, sort of gone too far. Uh, I provided information to journalists on the basis of documents that I believed uh, were necessary to demonstrate sort of criminal activities that had occurred within government. But I told the journalists that they should never publish a document on the basis of my sh sheer claims or allegations uh, and that they should publish no story. This was an actual condition of receiving access to the article or the archive. They could publish no story that they could not independently come to a public interest determination or sorry, that they could come to an independent editorial determination was in the public interest to know. Uh, meaning here, that it wasn't just newsy, right? Uh, not just that we get clicks, not just that it, you know, was of historic interest, but we actually needed to know in a democratic context. Uh, and I believe they've done a pretty good job uh, of doing this. Now, beyond this, as an additional check on their judgment, uh, because, you know, they have commercial and institutional incentives, they would go to the government uh, in advance uh, of it publication, not to give the government a veto, the government didn't get a veto on any of these stories, uh, but to tell the government generally, here's what we're going to be publishing and why. Uh, did we understand this? Is this going to put any individual at risk? Uh, is there something we didn't understand here? Uh, is this sort of detail going to reveal some agent behind enemy lines? And the government would have a chance to make their case that journalists didn't understand this. this. This had gone too far, that somebody would be placed at risk. And in all cases that I'm aware of, this process was followed. Uh, and I believe that this is the reason why uh, I am so confident that no one has come to harm as a result of these stories. This is why this reporting won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service, which is the highest prize in journalism in the United States uh, for reporting. Um, and this is why I believe, 
despite the government having every opportunity and incentive since 2013 to say, uh, you know, people died as a result of this, this was a horribly irresponsible thing. Here in 2016, we have never seen a single piece of evidence, credible or not, uh, that an individual has come to harm as a result of this reporting. Now, uh, a lot of people are going to be thinking about this in the context of WikiLeaks, and I do want to say one thing quickly here, uh, which is that WikiLeaks originally uh, occupied a very similar model. Uh, they worked with the New York Times and other press institutions uh, to give them access to the archive, but they didn't publish everything in bulk. Uh, a Guardian reporter did make a mistake and published the password to the archive that WikiLeaks had been sharing uh, openly in a book that they sold, uh, which then let everybody in the world get access to this. So WikiLeaks made this sort of editorial pivot decision to publish everything uh, in bulk at that point. Uh, and everybody said this was incredibly irresponsible. Uh, but that did happen in 2009. Uh, and in the trial of Chelsea Manning uh, in 2013, the government was asked to show the harm that resulted from this policy and show uh, who was hurt as a result. Uh, and they declined to do so because there wasn't actually any evidence of doing that. And even now, uh, whether it's on the basis of uh, sort of insider sources and classified reportage, uh, things that I read within the uh, intelligence community or anything else, it does not seem that anybody actually was hurt or died as a result. Now, there is a question here of, was it riskier? And it's fair to say that, you know, maybe it was. But I think it's very important for journalists, uh, even journalists who disagree very strongly with this model of publication, to remember that we do need evidence for making allegations. And there is a difference uh, between the risk of harm and the fact of harm. Uh before we get to uh, some questions from the journalists here, I have one more I want to uh, ask you. Uh, whistleblowing uh, looks like a uh, very lonely and obviously risky uh, thing to do. And I wonder if journalists uh, should know things about what whistleblowers go through that maybe we don't think about. Uh, that would help us be better at r receiving and, and asking for uh, material from whistleblowers. Yeah, I, I think this is a big problem. I'll, I'll try to keep it short because I know we got a lot of people in the room who want to get to questions. Uh, we don't have that much time. But when I was thinking about how to go through this, uh, I wasn't actually sure that I was going to go through with it. Uh, because I was scared, I was nervous, I was uh, not sure that it would make a difference. Uh, I think everybody struggles with these things. Um, and so the first thing I needed to do is I needed to establish contact with the journalists. Uh, and there's a very famous story, of course, where I, I tried to teach Glenn Greenwald, one of the journalists that I wanted to get in contact with, uh, how to use that GPG you described earlier, which is almost impossible to use correctly and safely. I would not recommend that uh, unless you are truly fighting against an adversary uh, that is, you know, only this old proven, uh, honestly pretty janky technology uh, is the reliable shield that you have, uh, or you're layering it with other technologies. So if one fails, you've still got that as a fallback. Uh, but he almost lost the story uh, because he never followed up on it. I was literally here, you know, going to NSA in the daytime and at nighttime recording videos uh, <laughs> specifically for him on how to use GPG. And he was going, oh, thanks so much for that. Yeah, I'll get it set up next week and then never doing it. Uh, try to put yourself in the position of the source. Now, this is also really uh, something that requires a lot of instinct on, on the part of the journalist uh, because I've seen this, uh, everybody who has opened one of these new secure drop, confidential uh, drop boxes for um, press outlets has seen it. Most of the stuff you get will be honestly crazy people uh, because there are a lot of honestly crazy people out there and they're fascinated with the idea of secrecy and encryption and conspiracy and it's just like they're going to be all over it. Uh, but crazy people typically write like crazy people. Uh, it's, I get a lot of them who write to me on Twitter, I can assure you. Uh, and <laughs> you can, uh, I, I think you guys know, you know, you, you get a feel for it. Uh, 
But if somebody feels even a little bit legitimate, uh, even if you don't know who they are, even if they haven't established bona fides, try to hear them out. Try to give them a little bit of rope. Try to give them a little bit of leeway. Uh, if they say, you know, try to use this tool and just trust me, it works. Uh, maybe give it a shot. Uh, don't jeopardize your work. You know, go to your throwaway computer, not the one that has all your secret sourcing material on it, because that could be one of those million dollar hackers sitting in Dubai. Um, but uh, there's a need to accept that people might be providing you information who you don't know their identity. Uh, you're, you're normally, you know, journalists say, you can tell me your identity. I won't tell my editor, I'll protect you. There are sources who were like myself, uh, I did this, who said, no, no, you don't understand. You won't know my identity yet. I'll provide other things that establish my bona fides. Uh, but until we meet in person, you're not really gonna know who I am. Uh, and it was until the journalists really left and I had left, uh, that was the case because sources aren't sure if they can trust you, just like you're not sure you can trust them. Okay, uh, let me uh, ask, we, our first question is gonna be from one of the journalists here who was part of the uh, Panama Papers uh, revelations, which started at this organization. So people are gonna come up to the camera here uh, and do it directly. Hi, hi, my name is Vanessa. I am a data journalist with Süddeutsche Zeitung. And um, yeah, when we published the Panama Papers in April, you were actually the first person tweeting about it 20 minutes Sorry before we... <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, actually, we, you leaked our leak and we are still wondering um, how you did it. <laughs> no, this is a funny thing because... <laughs> You know, people thought, did I have some inside source? You know, was somebody on the team told me that? Actually, no, I saw it on Twitter. Uh, I was on Twitter. Somebody else had leaked about it. Uh, I don't know whether they were from your team or whether they were from one of the partner institutions because I can't remember at this point. It was just some small tweet somewhere. And it had the link to your site, which had already gone live, uh, I believe. You hadn't tweeted it out, uh, but it had populated. And so I saw this site and I went, wow. <laughs> uh, and I, I wrote up the tweet about it uh, because it, you know, it had your story. I was, I was pulling from your quotes and everything about the, the volume of the leak. And it was, uh, it really impressed me. It was amazing reporting. Uh, and so I wanted to push it out and make sure it was seen by as many people. Uh, but yeah, I, I wish I had a more interesting story than that. Uh, <laughs> I'm, yes, sorry I, uh, I'm sorry I broke the embargo, but I didn't agree to it. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for that. And the more serious question is, um, as an investi investigative journalist, I'm also interested in your opinion on how intelligence services actually can use platforms like WikiLeaks or even journalists uh, to influence politics. Is, is it a real threat? Yeah, I mean, the, the question here is, is it actually a threat uh, if people are disseminating true information? Uh, I do think it's quite dangerous if we're getting doctored information, if we're getting uh, manipulated things, uh, because now suddenly it introduces this dynamic where we don't know if anything is true. Uh, but nobody has actually shown any of these recent documents to be inauthentic or false or even made the claim that a specific uh, document is false. Uh, there have been some people who have tried to kind of imply it in a general sense. Uh, but I mean, any journalist in the room recognizes Dodge when they see it. Um, but the, the thing here that I would think is, it is concerning uh, that we have people hacking into private individuals' emails and then publishing them, because uh, that's a dynamic that we've never seen before. But if these are very powerful officials uh, who are in positions of privilege and things like that, and it is revealing matters of public importance, uh, and it is being handled in a responsible way, journalists are going through these things uh, and making sure they can mitigate risks where possible, Again, I'm, I'm reluctant to use the word mitigating harms here because it's very difficult to see that there, there's any evidence that harms have actually occurred. Uh, but if intelligence services stop spying on the public generally and instead start airing each other's dirty laundry in a truthful way, are they actually harming us? Or are they opening doors for better understanding of society? Now, this requires this to not be a unilateral effort, right? We don't just want our adversaries 
uh, revealing our dirty laundry, but we would need to see the same thing in reverse. Uh, but maybe we, we would actually see a more truthful understanding of the world at that point uh, that benefits us. I don't really have a position on this. Uh, I'm just speculating here. But it does concern me if we see journalists who are saying, I'm nervous about getting too much true information about powerful officials in government. Uh, that seems like the opposite instinct, the opposite in reaction that they should have. I do think it's fair and reasonable for journalists to say, hey, let's be careful about protecting individuals' uh, information that might be revealed in these documents that is not of any public interest. Thank you. We have uh, another question. Hello. Uh, give me your name too. Nicolas. Say your name too. Yeah. I'm Nicolas from Mediapart uh, and the IT Network. And um, I have a, a bit of a concern. Um, during their investigations, journalists in newsrooms around the globe um, gather information about relatives of people involved in political or financial cases. And um, now uh, that journalists, um, you know, speak and build uh, tools together, uh, they want to share this information with other people to to, to help us developers uh, to more effic efficiently search big data sets and find uh, covers or nominees. You know, people are sharing their, uh, giving their name instead of uh, or some of someone else and in tax fraud contracts for example and should we oh. get concerned to become some kind of you know journalism NSA uh, because leaks can contain a lot of personal information and newsroom have a lot of personal information if we start to store it and share it between journalists yeah, it can be tricky to solve this problem you know, this is a very, uh, very complicated question. And I can't say that I got the right answer. Uh, you know, what do I know? I didn't graduate from high school. Uh, but in terms of general principles here, there's the question of <coughs> position for these large data sets, uh, e even my own, right? Uh, when we have this sort of top secret archive uh, that's resulted in so much public good, uh, there are details in it that shouldn't necessarily be published because they're provided to journalists for a background understanding uh, of what the government's actually doing behind closed doors, both bad and good, because they need to be able to independently assess uh, whether the government is lying to them or not, uh, whether the government is being truthful about the value of this program or whether they're just blowing smoke. Uh, but after most of the reporting has been done, uh, how do you protect it in a fairly responsible way, right? You can't mitigate all risks. And at this point, we don't really need to mitigate risks uh, to that extent because we're no longer living in 2013. Uh, the intelligence agencies have had plenty of time on their own to mitigate these risks and so on and so forth. Uh, risk reduces over time, right? When it's a surprise, it's more dangerous uh, than it is after the passage of years. But in this context where you're trying to, for example, uh, investigate, is some official, if I understand your correct question correctly, some official is engaged in corruption, uh, but they're smart enough not to put the secret Swiss bank account under their name, so they put it under some distant relatives, an aunt, uh, a cousin, a brother, or, you know, a spouse, or uh, whatever. Uh, and then later an investigative journalist wants to uh, say, hey, can you search for this individual, see if they're in there, uh, and the question is, how do you police that access? How do you protect people uh, who are in there, who are actually legitimate users of a legal service or uh, banking records or private emails? Uh, and I would argue this is actually the role of journalists to make those decisions in a free press, right? Uh, it's people in the public, uh, the civil body, the civic body, citizens can say whatever they want, they can do whatever they want, uh, but they're not necessarily uh, burdened with any special responsibility uh, to be uh, judicious or discreet or anything like that. Uh, governments, of course, don't really care and they'll do absolutely anything they can uh, to protect their secrecy, their own prerogatives. Uh, but journalists are somewhere in between. They are charged to represent the public uh, as the strong arm to challenge the government's monopoly control on information, 
but also corporate institutions, things like these corrupt law firms like Mossack Fonseca. Uh, but uh, when there are these hard questions, who should decide? Should the government make a law? Should they establish a rule? Or should we recognize that journalists are the only professional class who is really prepared and makes a career out of these kind of decisions? This is the editorial judgment, I would say, where you have to recognize that journalists can, will, and should make mistakes. Journalists should mitigate risks where possible, but they should embrace that doing journalism properly, the cost of democracy is uncertainty. And that in pursuing things, you could get things wrong. You could go too far. You could make a mistake uh, here or there. And you do hold an obligation to mitigate the risks when you can. And when you do something wrong, to try to respond to them in the most uh, responsible way. But don't pretend and do not accept uh, any kind of argument or burden imposed on you by the other side that says you have to be perfect. If you make a mistake, it delegitimizes you. Because if we do that, what we're doing is we're limiting the public's right to know, their access to knowledge about things that really do matter in uh, particularly data sets that are pretty questionable to begin with. Masek Fanseca exists to create shell companies. Uh, so in this context, yes, you, you don't want to expose people unfairly uh, or, or people uh, who necessarily aren't doing anything wrong. Uh, but at the same time, you should recognize if there are indications of badness uh, and you're getting tip-offs and things like that, uh, and they are existing in a pre-existing suspicious data set, uh, this is something that should be investigated. It doesn't necessarily say bypass the publication decision entirely. Uh, but I think we have to recognize that we can mitigate risks. We cannot eliminate them. Yes. But I'm, I'm concerned because we are still uh, storing data about people that are, mm -hmm. that might or might not be guilty in these cases. Right. Yeah, so this is the long-term disposition, and I don't think anybody has a good answer for this. Uh, but this actually brings up the question of another industry, another sort of professional class, uh, which is struggling to find their place in the modern world, and this is librarians. Maybe we should create a special library uh, or some kind of uh, university structure, uh, something that is respected and can be trusted, uh, enjoys some measure of faith by the public that they will do the right thing, uh, where they specialize in securing and holding over the long term these kind of sensitive data sets uh, and making them available for legitimate investigative use. Uh, and by this, I mean civil investigations, not governmental investigations necessarily. Uh, but allowing newspapers and journalists to move on to the next story. Uh, and over time, actually, as they connect this to other data sets, you know, it's not that they're becoming um, the NSA uh, for the journalism. Uh, it's that they're becoming the public body of knowledge about the truth of the world, what's really happening uh, for the public while trying to manage those risks in the most responsible way. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. We're running uh, near the time we had. Um, Let's try to get two more questions in if we can. Anybody else want to come up? I got to keep it short, though. Yeah. <laughs> And then I have, I'm going to have one final one for you uh, after a couple of short ones. Hi there. Uh, I'm Janusz Grühl, running for Süddeutsche Zeitung. And I have a more personal question. Uh, I think two years ago, there was a discussion about you and possible asylum in Germany. So I was wondering mm -hmm. whether anything has changed on that or whether you think you have to stay out of the EU and the transatlantic context forever. We, we have seen some changes. Uh, I, I mean, in uh, the last year, we saw the, uh, where is it, I apologize. Uh, we saw the uh, European Parliament actually pass a resolution uh, saying that EU member states uh, should not uh, honor the criminal charges against me because they're political in nature, uh, and I should not be extradited. Uh, and this is from any member state in the EU. Uh, this was passed in favor, and more broadly, they said that whistleblowers need to be protected. 
uh, and should be protected, not just me, right? Let's recognize that this is a larger issue than what happens to me. Uh, and I think that's the, the real focus here. It is unfortunate uh, that the German government, despite seeing uh, everything that's happened, uh, and despite seeing the fact that there has been no harm, uh, the fact that the United States government has done uh, investigations and found, for example, the programs revealed uh, these kind of mass surveillance records, the telephony, telephony metadata program under Section 215 of the Patriot Act uh, was actually ended. This reporting led to the most significant reforms uh, in U.S. surveillance capabilities since the 1970s. And these programs hadn't been making us safer. In fact, they hadn't made a concrete difference in a single investigation. And this is the White House's group saying this, not uh, sort of radical opposition groups saying this. It is, I think, really unfortunate uh, that they're still saying uh, they can't do anything, not because it wouldn't be the right decision, uh, but because they think the United States government would punish them. Uh, they would let Germans die uh, by not sharing vital information with Germany uh, if they granted, if they protected my human rights. Uh, and I, I think that's just a, a, a very disappointing thing uh, because if human rights are becoming negotiable, uh, because there's another large, powerful government that uh, is benefiting you in some way. If you don't respect that, how will Germany stand up to China if a similar uh, circumstance happens in any other context? It doesn't have to be a particular individual. Uh, human rights aren't chips that you can trade around. Uh, and moreover, let's be real here. Uh, I, I don't want to get too, too political. Uh, but in the context of the last few years, uh, it's fair to say that global opinion uh, of my decisions has only increased over time as it has become more clear uh, that the only consequences that have come out of uh, this journalism, uh, and I don't mean my journalism, I mean the reporting that actually hit the story, because again, I have never published a single document on my own. Um, the consequences have been positive uh, a lot of the allegations against me have changed. Uh, the idea that the United States government would sanction Germany in retaliation uh, for protecting a whistleblower is a fantasy, and honestly, it should be an embarrassment. Go ahead. All right. Hi, I'm Fred. I'm a developer with the OSCRP, and we're here at a hack day, right? So I want to kind of ask the inverse question to my French colleague, which is, how do we become the journalism NSA? So, I mean, you spend more... <laughs> more time than anyone studying all those NSA programs. There must have been a few where you, you thought, oh my God, I wish that kind of analytical capability was used for public <laughs> interest purposes. So which ones should we rebuild? It, it would be nice to see if uh, see a world in which surveillance were working for the public rather than against it largely. Uh, but it is a dangerous road. And I get concerned about uh, creating systems that can be turned around. Uh, there is a proliferation context here. However, in your defense, uh, these capabilities are coming. We can't stop them. We already see they're commercially available uh, in more and more contexts. Uh, there was uh, recently a story in The Intercept just a few days ago by a reporter uh, named uh, R.J. Gallagher uh, on the mass surveillance uh, sort of hardware vendor in New Zealand who is creating the mass surveillance systems that are used in the United Kingdom. Uh, but for, for this, uh, briefly, I think what you're missing that the NSA has uh, is the intersection of data sets, right? Uh, it's like we were just talking about with AT&T. Uh, you can have a metadata repository for when calls were being made, uh, and that's super valuable on its own. It reveals a lot of information. But when suddenly you can tag on the location that these calls were being made from, you have a, a far more in-depth set of capabilities. When you can now uh, correlate this with web traffic, when you now can correlate this with email traffic, that's when it starts getting truly terrifying. Uh, the question that I would turn around on you is, if you made a journalism uh, machine uh, that rivals the NSA, uh, how could you actually ensure that it would only be used appropriately? That, you don't actually have to respond there. That's his return. <laughs> <laughs> I know I don't have an answer, but I, I do have a... Uh, Last question that uh, is, uh, 
I, next week, I'm going to be uh, introducing to a bunch of a uh, couple hundred journalism students uh, Laura Poitras's brilliant film, Citizen Four, about Hong Kong and the events there and what you've done. Uh, these are smart, uh, interesting, and very concerned about the future uh, kinds of people. Do you have anything you want to say to young journalists uh, about the future and what they should be doing? I think something to understand is how wrong we can all be. Uh, when I was younger, I grew up in a federal family. I grew up in the shadow of the NSA uh, throughout much of my adolescence. I signed up for the U.S. Army when everyone else was protesting the Iraq War. Uh, because I believed a simple truth, which was the government would not lie to us. Now, I based that on a, a, a simple calculation, which was that it simply wouldn't be worth it to them. The long-term costs would be much greater than the short-term uh, gains. But the reality is that government is not a capital G, uh, where it's a single institution that thinks rationally and coherently uh, and in a coordinated fashion. Uh, there are a number of different parties, uh, different groups, uh, different interests inside government uh, that are looking out for their own agendas. And in many cases, the capable or the individuals who rise to the highest levels of government are those who are honestly the most capable manipulators. Whether this is something about you know the way politics work, uh, something about the way influence works, you know, I, I don't want to to speculate there, but. What this means is that actually it is our most powerful officials that we should trust the least. And in my experience, it is the ones that are the lowest on the totem pole, the working level people that I sat beside every day who could actually be trusted the most. Now, this is not to say it applies in all cases. There are exceptions on both sides. But when you see a powerful official simply asserting something, and you see newspapers uh, simply repeating it and not critically evaluating it. This is a dynamic that should concern everyone. Uh, and you should be sure to say that even if everyone else engages in this, I will be different. That's uh, a great note uh, on which to end. And uh, I want to thank you personally. And I know that the room will want to thank you for joining us. This has been uh, pretty interesting stuff. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Enjoy the conference. Thank you.